Greetings, everyone, and welcome to day four of I Annotate 2021. I'm really happy to have you all here today. Welcome to our fourth keynote um, that we'll start in just a second. As you probably all know now, and you can tell if you can see the words on the screen, I'm Nate Angel from Hypothesis. I want to actually get to the main business of this morning, which is this keynote that we've been long, long anticipated, and that is with um, Ramey Kalir and Antero Garcia. Um, and I'm not going to say a lot about them um, because uh, I think uh, many of you already know who they are and they're going to say a little bit about themselves, I think, by way of an introduction. But I will just say that um, it is through the work of these two fellows that um, that I think has really changed the conversation around annotation in general through the publication of this book and all the other work that they do that they're going to talk about today. And that book um, is called Annotation. And I was just looking, I had my copy sitting right here and now it's gone, but I'm sure they'll show it off to you later. And so without further ado, I'm going to pass the baton over to Ramey, who's going to get things started. Um, and I will back out of the way and let them speak for themselves. Ramey, take it away. Hey, thank you so much, Nate. And thank you so much to everybody at Hypothesis for organizing I Annotate. Antero, my dear friend, Hello. how are you? I'm good. Hey, Remy, how are you? Hi. So I, I just gave Ontario a pop quiz a few moments ago, and he, you know, sharp as a tack. I asked him, when was the first time that we did a keynote together, or at least at the same event? Yeah. I, I didn't know it was five years ago, which is the thing that was useful to know. But is it Aurora Public Schools? I think just down the street from where, where you are, if, yeah. if you're not trying to disclose your, your <laughs> intel. But, uh... Yeah. So Ontario and I were in Aurora, Colorado, talking with some lovely K-12 colleagues. And yeah. I saw Ontario, I think maybe for the first time, um, do something in his keynotes that I've always appreciated, which is to ask the question, what are you reading? So, <laughs> Ontario, what are you reading right now? What am I reading right now? I, I just, start, I, so it's funny, uh, I'm reading, uh, We Do This Till We Free Us by Miriam Kaba. Uh, it, is a, it is a popular book that I think folks are reading. I recommend it as a thing. I'm only partway through it, but I knew her work. I got in a whole argument about this book. I, was, I went to a tattoo parlor on, um, speaking of annotation, I went to a tattoo parlor on uh, last Friday and got in a big argument about abolition uh, with the guy who's permanently putting something on my body. Uh, and so that was um, around abolition. So that was, that was a fun thing to talk about. Um, yeah, Christy, I think it's an excellent book. Uh, Ramey, what are, what are you reading right now? Yeah, um, I'm, so I'm reading a, a lovely text by Dr. Cesare Warren. This is about centering possibility in black education. Uh, this summer, I'm teaching a class called School and Society. And so given many things that are happening right now, this seemed like a, a, an appropriate text. Um, and we'd actually love to hear from folks as yeah. we all begin to gather this morning, like, what are you reading? Um, you know, drop it into the chat. People are introducing themselves. They're telling us where they are, or where they're from. Um, but you're very welcome in our chat this morning as we start this really kind of casual conversation. What are you reading right now? And if yeah. you want to take it a step further, uh, I think if folks know there's a conference hashtag, whether you're on Twitter or you're on Instagram, take a picture of the book cover take a picture of your annotations, put it out on the feed, and we can start to curate a list of what we're all collectively reading. So thanks, Ontario. We're gonna start this conversation today uh, with some reflections. Ontario, we've written a book together. Ooh, we've put sure. it out in the world. <laughs> we've invited people to mark it up, and we've invited people to have what we're calling an anno convo, an annotation conversation. And this book, it's been out in the world for a few months now, at least in this form, and we can talk maybe a little bit later about its earlier iterations. But we've received some really interesting responses, and I'm wondering if you can help take us into this moment and this and this bit of discourse. Yeah, I, I, have, a, I have a grumpy dog behind me who has feelings about this, but uh, a friend and colleague, uh, Victor Lee, he's a, he's a professor here at Stanford um, and the current president of the uh, Society for Learning Sciences. Um, he, he kind of went on a, a mini thread. There's, there's, a, there's a series of tweets that this is the first one um, that he shared a couple weeks ago um, that really just talks about, you know, growing up, right, the fear of damaging and writing in books made it feel taboo, right? Like who gets to write in books and what's it mean? Um, and now, you know, as a, as a stuffy Stanford professor, right, he has plenty of, he, he clarified later, he has plenty of books that he can write in. Um, 
and and but even then like it, it still creates something of an anxiety a feeling of anxiety to you know take pen to paper and write in the book in the way that i think Remy, you and i deliberately envision people writing in our book right that we want people to do and so i think this makes us at least makes me think of you know who like who has the privilege who has the power to get to write in books where are those practices learned uh, and and what kinds of lessons are carried with the practices of annotation? I, I can give an example, and I'm gonna, I think we'll share a couple of pictures in my classroom uh, back when I used to be a high school teacher in a moment. Um, but you know, when I was a teacher, I realized uh, what was really powerful for me was going to college and getting to write in books as an English major, right? Getting to uh, getting to mark things up and you know, probably as a, a dumb 18 year old, feeling smart, trying to trying to jot my notes in. Um, I don't know, Faulkner or some other kind of problematic dead white author. Um, and and I tried to replicate those practices when I was teaching my students. And so I'd buy like the cheap Dover editions of Shakespeare, or I'd buy my students their own copies of um, the autobiography of Malcolm X specifically to teach them. We would we would annotate and mark up the books at the same way, right? Everybody underline this sentence and write this in the margins as a practice of acculturating towards annotation in a way that's a very different relationship to books than I think what kids are schooled to do in particular kinds of contexts. So I think that might be a starting place. And Remy, I don't know what your thoughts yeah. were when um, when Victor started sharing the, this tweet on June 3rd. Well, of course, it like you, made me think a lot about notions of access and participation. And it led eventually, and Victor and I went back and forth on Twitter a bit, and <laughs> again, we've been having these conversations in various forms for, for years with yeah. readers. And it got me to ask this question about these rights, so to speak the kind of norms or these cultural practices, some of which are literally written down and some of which remain unwritten that are associated sure. with annotation. Now, I know that you shared this tweet in its other forms and other spaces, and I yeah. believe that you got this response. Is that right? Yeah, so I uh, I will confess for a couple of you who follow me on Instagram, I'm trying to figure out how to use Instagram. I, I do not know that platform well, and so I, I, I make messy stories and don't quite know what I'm doing. So I took Victor's tweet and just put it as an Instagram story. And then a good friend, Danny Martinez, a professor at UC Davis, um, powerful literacy scholar, uh, replied to me, which then I took his reply and put it, made it public because um, that, that's what I do with Danny. Um, but he wrote, uh, damn, how about getting in trouble in school because you wrote on the Los Angeles Unified School District issued book, uh, damn man, why you gotta be racist like that, right? And so he's both joking, but kind of reminding, you know, particularly for, uh, the black and brown students that Danny and I both taught as we taught in South LA, South Central Los Angeles, uh, and, and he and Watts, um, you know, the, the idea of not writing, of writing in books was something that just wasn't permissible, right? It's, it's just something that's not allowed. And I think Danny ties this, at least in my interpretation of knowing him as a teacher, is tying this specifically to issues of race and class in a large metropolis like Los Angeles, right? So that, you know, annotation is specifically not something that is encouraged and is actively discouraged um, by systemic power in the country, right? So that, that felt like a, a nice starting place. I also just wanted, because I'm, I'm trying to follow chat as we're talking, which probably isn't the best uh, active presence, but uh, Danza, I appreciate your comment here, right? Of like, when you go back and look at your annotation and you can see, uh, it's like a different version of you that might've been annotating in the past. And I think that's just a useful reminder of like the, the historical record, which I think we'll, we'll also get into as, as we keep Absolutely. Talking. So Ontario, you remind us that you know annotation expresses power, and this is a key argument that that we make in the book in a variety of ways. But it's these are photographs that that you took, right? From this is my very first classroom. This was yeah. uh, for people who are wondering. This is room P seventy five uh, at Manual Arts High School. It was uh, they call it a bungalow, uh, but it is just the portable building that should have been demolished years ago. And the first. When I, when I first went in that classroom uh, in 2006, I think is when I when I was at, was teaching in there, uh, there was a, a young tagger who I never met, but whose presence like a ghost uh, just oh, devoured every space of that classroom. It, you you turn over, this is the trash can on the left hand side, and it would say Fonse Wadi on the bottom of the trash can in, in uh, marker. And if you look at the power breaker uh, on the right hand side, uh, this the same tagger had also tagged the the uh, power breaker Fonse Wadi, and I remember using the the white screen to pull down for an LCD projector. And when I pulled it down, the entire thing I don't have this picture was tagged Fonse Wadi, and I just appreciate the overwhelming presence of this young person who, despite schools not allowing kids to annotate, this this student had clearly made their presence well known within this classroom. This was their domain much more than mine. Um, to, to years later, I would randomly, you know, I'd open up like a desk drawer and, and sure enough, 
there would be a Fonse Wadi there. It's probably still there now, which I, I, I'd love to think about it. Yes, um, this 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 person, yeah, I think that's the right word. This person was prolific uh, as an annotator of a particular space and context. Um, and in the same way that LUSD is trying to control and shape power around annotation, the student also is expressing a kind of enactment of power. And so I think, you know, I think of a couple other images we'll get into around graffiti, but graffiti has been the thing that when I think about my classroom context, my teaching context, stays with me as, as an analog annotation practice. Absolutely. And so then tell us about this book, because you also included this here. And I think as I was looking at this and as we've been talking, it reminded me of something that we've written about in our sure. book now about annotation functioning as a resource that is yeah. leveraged like your student yeah, across yeah. again text and social settings right and it expresses power on behalf of constituencies for their ideological ends yeah th so i don't know and maybe if, in chat I don't, I don't know if always running is a popular mainstream book but at least in uh south central where my students were this was a this was a popular memoir that many of my students read um it is about uh gang life in Los Angeles um, and is, is told from um, the point of view of someone who experienced that life. Uh, there, there's a couple of things I want to point to. So this is the cover of the book. It is blurry. This was a picture taken with a phone uh, a decade and a half ago, right? So you just think of the, the blame, blame Apple, I guess. Um, but there's two things I want to think through, right? There's, there's a book cover and it gives you the content information of someone's back tattoo and the title of the book and pull quotes. There is an ugly label that the school has then annotated on top of it. AR stands for Accelerated Reader. Uh, it is a proprietary product that allows students to know if they are allowed to read this book. It tells you the level and the number of points they get for the book, right? So you get this assessment practice that is annotated on top of it. That's fine. And most of the books look like that at, at the school and in a way that is pretty interesting to label. And you can see that lower levels, the books look dumber, right? I would use the, word, the language that my students would say. They look like children's books that you're giving to teenagers, right? The, they become floppy picture books. Um, and so you can think about the demoralizing reading practices around the AR system. Um, but the other thing that's harder to see on here is that back tattoo picture on the cover of the book is also marked up by students who are tagging that cover, right? So there's, it's not just one tagger, there's a conversation that's happening across different students uh, crews tagging the cover of this book, right? So they see a gang, a book about gang affiliation, and they too are marking that with with the different kinds of affiliations and labeling. And so you can read a kind of history and lineage of who's engaging with this book. Whether or not they're opening the cover is a different thing. Um, but I think it's fascinating to think through like these three different kinds of annotations that are happening on this one cover and the ways that they're enacting different kinds of conversation and power. It may not be in relation to one another, right? I actually don't think the kids who are marking up their uh, their crews are the same, are, care about the AR sticker and vice versa, but it, there is a parallel set of annotation practices happening there. And I, I don't know, I, I think maybe coming back to Fonse Wadi and whoever this this young tagger was, right? Like there is something about the world around these kids is constantly annotated. Everything around them has writing on it and whether or not it counts uh, is the conversation that that to me has been as as we finish the book and thinking about like what we didn't get to put into it, this is what this is what it's been coming back to is like what counts and like who's it get to, who does it get to count for particularly if I think about you know the students at this school as an example. Absolutely. And so then speaking <laughs> of students at the school and writing around them and writing on their world, yeah, and helping to kind of author narratives on their world. You know, we happen to write again that annotation. You know, like these other media, right? Megaphones, tweets, spray yeah, paints. Yeah. In this case, you know, it's a tool that can be used purposefully. What's the what's the purpose here? What do we see? You know, this learner so, doing. So the lesson I want to share here, uh, and Remy, I apologize because I, I really so it's the background for everybody else. I dumped a whole bunch of pictures in our slide deck, and Remy's doing a masterful job of pulling them together and trying to figure out what the narrative was with all of these, and is doing great. But just want to recognize, like, what? How does this picture relate to the always running picture? So. Our, our school had some amazing murals and professional graffiti artists who came in. I don't know what a professional graffiti artist is. That's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> but had renowned graffiti artists come in and um, create these murals across the campus that were beautiful. Uh, and so this was this had uh, this talked about it, the uh, family trailers. It was like a family center that was um, outside the parking lot at the school. Um, and the fascinating thing to me is you can see the kind of 
you know, from from maybe maybe something closer to an objective lens, the kind of artistic intent that people might differentiate from what they think is quote unquote gang graffiti. I, I tend to disagree with with these distinctions, but I don't. I think most people could see this as artistic, uh, and I realize that is a subjective statement. Um, but what you're seeing is uh, the custodian painting over. Uh, the 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 tags uh, here, right? So this is a beautiful mural that is now being painted back to um, as as a, as a graffiti critic talked about in Los Angeles several years ago, the beijing of the LA city, right? That uh, all of the graffiti is just painted over with like ugly beige paint, which somehow just make it makes the city uglier than if the graffiti wasn't there to begin with. And so there is there is something fascinating to me about you know there was a purposeful label and, and use of this particular text that was applicable for school contexts, uh, and even then. Um, our eyes in terms of interpreting the social context of what graffiti stands for and as an annotation practice uh, makes it invisible as the purpose. And so it again becomes painted over by the school. And this happened with most of the murals on campus as well. They, they eventually all uh, were ceded to time and to traditional authority in that sense. So I think there's there's a lesson here. I'm not quite sure what the lesson is. Um, but well, that's a very point. Yeah. No, that's good, Antero. And obviously, I clearly misinterpreted the, the image <laughs> as I was throwing all this together. But actually, it's really quite apropos because we're about to talk about redaction. So, mm -hmm. redaction as annotation is really a nice little thread yeah, yeah. through here. That's great. <laughs> so, what's going on here? Oh boy! All right, I promise these are the. I, I I'd put an embarrassing picture of myself in here. So, there's two more kinds of annotation. I'll move beyond graffiti and talk about um, uh, talk about maybe. Uh, analog annotation. So our school moved to a school uniform, um, which the students didn't love. And so uh, these are the hands of my friend Peter showing one student's annotation practices. So what he would do, the student who didn't want to wear the uniform would wear his hoodie in class every day uh, or into school walking past the security guards with just the color of his school uniform as a means of demonstrating that the student was wearing uh, the uniform and then would take off the collar and would be able to uh, participate in school without actually wearing the uniform. I think there's there's a brilliant kind of cloaking, maybe, maybe a literal cloaking if it, if it was with the hoodie uh, that allowed the student to move in as an annotation practice. The other side is, uh, uh, this was our bathroom pass uh, that, I'm, that I'm demonstrating here. They, they gave every classroom a, a yellow construction safety vest that if you wanted to go to the restroom, you needed to wear this vest. Uh, my students found it really demoralizing. I found it really stupid as a thing. If I'm being, I also got in a lot of trouble at my school. Maybe this is maybe this is what's coming across here. Um, and so I told my students like, "This is an ugly vest." Uh, one student suggested I could paint it for you. Uh, and so it's not a very good picture, but but what is what he painted was a big fist, right? Like holding up like a fist on the back of the vest. And I'm like, "That's pretty cool. Like that that fits in with the lines of solidarity and activism that I was trying to instill in my classroom." Um, and so this was one of two days where this vest was allowed until when my students wore it and it got confiscated by the security guard. When I talked to the principal about why, like it was still a functional vest, it still looked like the other hall passes. Uh, it, it got confiscated, they said, because it might be confusing. Uh, they might not understand how the vest functioned. And so there's something around, I, you know, I think that's bullshit, right? I think that that doesn't make a whole lot of sense of like why you would confiscate the vest. But I also understand why they did it. I think it probably wasn't the best adult decision I made to have my student uh, graffiti the vest um, for, for power for my students. Um, but but there is something to think through, like what are the kinds of political choices, right? I think to the quote here, right? Like every kind of annotation is a political annotation, right? Uh, it is an objection of the school uniform, right? To, to take the collar and wear that as a way to get into school. It is an objection to the ways that we dehumanize students by make them look like construction workers in order to go to the bathroom um, on their campus and in order to, you know, uh, embarrass them, right? I think there, I think there is a lesson here for students to think about, um, and the ways that we kind of, you know, it is. I think the kind of cat and mouse game of school uh, is is useful to think through, right? It's oftentimes adults trying to squash young people's ingenuity is is where we see uh, contestations of power. It's where we see the viral images of usually young black young uh, black uh, boys and girls who are being uh, body slammed to the floor. Is the viral images that I'm thinking of. Um, by police officers, right, are about contesting particular kinds of racialized power in this country. And so what's it mean to take sides and potentially act in solidarity with young people? What's it mean to question those mechanisms? And at least to me, how can we, how can annotate function in that way, right? And I think this is a thing that we'll get into throughout this, but the question that I would have, uh, maybe for you, Remy, but for everybody is, what are the ways that annotation is doing good in the world, right? To the Miriam Kaba book, right, we do this till we free us. How How is 
how is annotation and for, and for the 62 of you in the session right now how are your annotation practices making this world freer right like and and who is us right in that sentence right so th i think those would be the things i would push as i was thinking about these images Raymond, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm just rambling at you. Oh, this is great. No, because it relates so well on Twitter, and this is exactly why this is, you know, why we're bringing ourselves into conversation with each other, because our thinking is always changing as well. And our yeah. thinking is also, in this case, you know, kind of bouncing off of other people's ideas that mm -hmm. have been even in this conference this week. And I'm thinking now about our colleague and our friend, Sharice yeah. McBride. She presented as a panelist uh, about the relationship of annotation practices and digital literacies on Monday. And then on Tuesday, she was listening to our other friend and colleague, Joe Dillon, who's again, a K-12 educator here in the Denver area, speak about his practices engaging students in annotation. And I love what kind of Sharice is saying in conversation with Joe, because it really echoes on Tara what you're talking about as well. At one point, Sharice says, we are privileged, perhaps we being educators or we being adults, we are the ones who are privileged to be able to know what it is that students see and think really honoring the ways in which they are reading their world and then they can also write their world and then it's up for us to design towards those ends and to, to the question you just mentioned to design perhaps towards more liberatory more justice oriented ends yeah and so i love that sharice is reading joe's commentary and it echoes your questions and it ultimately again for, for i think for us and for some of the questions that we've tackled in our work comes back to this core question of how do learners write annotation, yeah. right? And, and again, like, do they write annotation in perfunctory ways, in ways that perhaps may be seen as irrelevant? Or is that a form of resistance? And is that also a form of creative agency? And so sitting with this question, I think is also really important for us. And so then here's the connection back to redaction though, yeah. right? So yeah. here's, the, here's the, the trailers and, you know, covering up of the, of the murals and the graffiti, but in a different way. And so tell us like, or to, to tell, tell everyone a little bit about how as we were writing our book, our engagement with, with Isabel O'Hare, the poet, and how we, how we saw her work. Yeah, and it's been, you know, she's been someone who's been in, in loose conversation with us since, since uh, reaching out to her to include this, this image and this work in, in the book, right? But, you know, I think as a, as a blackout poet, I think she's a, a other, she probably identifies as a poet broadly, but uh, the genre here is blackout poetry, right? So she's taken the apology letters, uh, her, her book, it's a really powerful book, uh, is a collection of all of the, of, of many apology letters from terrible predatory men who've been part of the, uh, uh, identified as part of the Me Too movement or have led to the instanti instantiation of the Me Too movement. And so what you can see here is, uh, her taking uh, Harvey Weinstein's apology statement, uh, blacking out most of the text and making and remixing it into something uh, much more critical and much more powerful, right? And I think it is at least for me when I sat when I sat down and read through uh, the book, it is it is an emotional and powerful statement to think through. What's it mean to redact? What's it mean to give voice when when things are voiceless? I I've been particularly thinking about maybe some of you. Um, since the New York Times documentary, I've been thinking about Britney Spears and her conservatorship and uh, what's it mean for her to uh, be literally be given voice in court after, you know, more than a decade of not having agency over her own actions uh, yesterday and basically asking for the same free will that I think most of us are afforded, right, as, as a kind of example here, right? It's it's not an annotation. Um, I wouldn't argue. I'd love to have the, the the theoretical conversation with some of you, but there is something fascinating to think through. Like, what's it mean to extract voice, to take voice from someone else's harmful words? What's it? What's it mean to uh, find new voice from what's within there? I think there maybe it is something like a. Um, I don't quite know how trees work, but I think you can tap a tree for maple syrup if it's the right kind of tree in the right kind of context. You probably need the right kinds of tools. So this, this is probably the right the right parallel. Um, but what's the what's the maple syrup from from the different kinds of statements that we might be able to pull from? Didn't expect to go down the the maple syrup <laughs> route. <laughs> yeah, I, I do not know how trees work. That is absolutely correct. <laughs> well, it's an interesting analogy because of course people don't ask trees for their consent when they tap them for maple syrup, <laughs> which is how I'm going to bring it back to this because <laughs> I know that at least this community, uh, from both technical perspectives, but also from, again, more politically oriented perspectives have really grappled with the uh, relationship of annotation to consent. Yeah, That's a question that we talk about in our book. We touch yeah. on it. We wrestle with it. Uh, we have a section of our chapter about power that explicitly asks the question, can I annotate that? And, you know, in engaging with Isabel and 
getting permission from her, her consent to feature her work. We also know that she did not ask consent to redact yep. and share and then publish her versions of these sexual assault apology statements, right? Yeah. And so I think that, you know, we don't make in our book a blanket case that consent is irrelevant. In fact, we make a pretty powerful argument. I think that it's really important to consider context yeah. as a paramount uh, element of the power dynamics and often differential relationships that exist when engaging in the act of annotation. Yeah. But I think that Isabel's work, her poetry, um, and this particular use of redaction, but also to the redaction of covering of the graffiti, yeah. you know, it then relates to this question here, who, who has the right to annotation, yeah. um, which I think is something that we should all really sit with, whether we're educators in classrooms or whether we're designing technologies that allow people to take yeah. notes, wherever that may be. I mean, it feels like a... In addition, like, <clears throat> I think if I, if I was thinking about this with my students in my classroom today, the same students in the Fonswadi classroom, uh, I would I would think about the can I annotate that both from like a technical perspective, but also the, you know, I think ethics is probably a thing we don't teach very well in schools, but it's that should I annotate that? And I think that that gets to a deeper reflection of ourselves in relation to the world. And, and you know, to Charissa's tweet from, from a couple of slides ago, right? Like this is, a, I think, you know, probably the, the reason I spend so much time doing educational research when I could be in a classroom probably being a, like, I think I was a pretty good teacher and I don't do that anymore. I don't have the energy in the way that I did in the, in the past is really because I think, you know, it's about believing young people as genius and as brilliant. And I think Sharice is getting to this of, you know, how do we ensure that young people's voices are participating in the civic world around us, right? That is the large perspective of, you know, why, why I've, I've sold out and, and live in the academy to some extent. It's about yeah. trying to elevate young people's voice in civic society. And, yeah. you know, I think, I think that should I, should I annotate that, right, is, is the beginning kinds of conversation that young people should have. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't not talk about the pandemic, and I think we'll get to it. Um, but an image I've been thinking about lately from the uh, same time I was in the classroom, I remember teaching about Hurricane Katrina, um, my second year as a teacher. Um, is thinking about the ways that houses in New Orleans were annotated uh, mm -hmm. to point to if bodies were in those ha in those houses and uh, and other kinds of dangerous information, right? And I think about the ways we marked up in another kind of graffiti, graffitied these houses to indicate the kinds of damage and loss and trauma that occurred in different kinds of communities. And so, you know, I don't think our I don't think our nation has anywhere near uh, considered. The ongoing trauma and harm and healing that's going to have to happen in this country as a result of the pandemic and the hundreds of thousands of people that have died. Um, we, we've talked. You and I have talked about the New York Times cover as a kind of example here, as as a as a memorial. Um, but you know, there's no there's no wide scale uh, memorial in the same way that we think about you know um, for George Floyd or for other kinds of localized um, loss uh, and and murder that have happened. Uh, and what's it mean for us to think through like how might annotation in that way remind us? I think all of us have been hit personally by this, by the pandemic. Um, and if I lost or know people who have lost people um, or have been forever uh, changed by it, but what would it mean to take the scale of what happened in Katrina, right? And to be able to visually see, right, um, across this country, the ways that things have happened or across the, you know, across, yeah. across the world, right? But I'm thinking of this from a, a U.S. perspective right now. Yeah, absolutely. And no, and we're going to certainly, in just, just a moment here, kind of yeah. touch on, 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 on you know, dual pandemics um, mm -hmm. and how those are marked and yep. remarked and memorialized. Um, but, you know, just to, it's, it's, you know, just as an interesting segue here, because Ontario, you were just mentioning the importance of kind of youth civic activism and the need, as you were saying, to really find ways of amplifying, you know, learners, yep. young people's visions of their futures. Um, both within formal schooling and, and, and outside of it. And that, of course, resonates, I think, so so strongly with our keynote from yesterday. Yeah. So just a quick shout out to, again, our colleague, we both know him well, um, Prof. Manuel Espinosa, and again, his colleague in the Right to Learn Dignity Lab, Frida Silva. Um, when they were giving their keynote here at IATA yesterday, they mentioned Du Bois's The Freedom to Learn. Yeah. Um, and I immediately jumped onto the Internet Archive. Thank you so much, Internet Archive, and found <laughs> you know, this particular essay from 1949, there was a question towards the end of Frida and Profe's keynote 
asking about the name of right to learn. You know, where does that come from? Mm -hmm. And they mentioned this quote, um, of all the civic rights for which the world has struggled and fought for 5,000 years, the right to learn is undoubtedly the most fundamental. Um, and I think that it's you know, important for us to you know, reference that prior orientation, given even some of our commentary this morning, to kind of hold this in our minds as well as we move into some of our additional commentary yeah, and I think that we're talking in some ways, you know, about maybe a more humble act, an act of, of of annotation, but this idea of again the right to learn as perhaps a broader umbrella to the right to annotation, again brings me back to you know these sets of relationships that yep. we've now been kind of talking across the last few moments, and I think is what we want to really orient everyone to today is that there are rights of annotation, these kind of again norms or cultural practices, written and unwritten that then inform the way in which people write as annotation. And again, what is permissible and what is not. Yep. And ultimately speaking to this broader question of the right to annotation. And so we can see this across these examples, again, examples of redaction and expression or expression being covered by redaction. And again, how we understand more broadly this right to learn. Yeah. And that. it brings us here. And so then Ontario, this brings us back to our pandemics, yep. right? Yep. The pandemics that many people, but of course in very different ways, have been wrestling with, buffeted by, and again, as you said, irrevocably changed because of not only over the past 15, 16 months, but of course for, for, for centuries. Um, and so I want to orient all of us to this, this photograph. Um, Ontario and I have shared it before, and, and we use it as to kind of, again, help expand this conversation about what counts as annotation. So if you follow the link at some point, you'll notice that this was featured in a New York Times article just over a year ago at a time when, again, protests uh, in support of Black Lives, specifically in response to Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, but of course, many other injustices, and also then the ongoing you know, just upheaval resulted in a wall, a yep. temporary wall, but a wall being placed around Lafayette Square mm -hmm. next, to the White, next to the White House. And so in this photograph, we see two learners, two readers, two writers. We see Zayden Cuevas and we see Angelica Cuevas. The article doesn't specify if that's his mother, perhaps an older sister or an aunt. But here we see Zayden and Angelica Cuevas. And, you know, Ontario, you and I both used to teach, you know, again, people about Zayden's age. Um, you were, of course, telling us you know, stories of your students earlier. And so when yep. we see this kind of an image, I think it's a useful reminder for us that we can reorient ourselves to these three tensions, these yep. three opportunities, right, around the rights of annotation, to write as annotation, and then the right to annotation. Um, and so, you know, we'll just riff a little bit more here, but, you know, we yep. seldom contest these questions with our cookbooks, right? You know. When we open up our cookbooks and we make marks about food that we eat, we often don't worry about the rights of annotation and what is or is not permissible and whether or not writing annotation is something that should be, again, contested. And in some cases, again, to Victor's tweet earlier and to some of yeah. the conversations that you mentioned, people have then different relationships to their everyday texts, whether those everyday texts or you know manuscripts from you know, decades, if not centuries ago, you know, or, or the newspaper. Um, but it ultimately, again, brings us back to the built environment and yep. broader social and political discourses, right? Yep. In that whether we're looking at the Berlin Wall or we're looking at, again, the debate around what is a monument and how is a monument, quote unquote, defaced or counter storied, that we see these relationships in our everyday texts and our everyday social and political contexts, again, wherever we may look. Yeah. I, so I want, I want to sit with the word everyday for a second, but Ramey, because of this slide, I also want to, I, I feel like I want to recognize a great pun I made in the chat that you can't see and just want to validate myself. I'm calling what you have here on the text the McConaughey principle because it's about all right, all right, all right. And that feels like an important uh, movie quote, uh, just, just to recognize that, that hey, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's not great. Uh, I, when I think about every day and I think about every day texts and everyday people, um, I, I, I am uh, a mentor, Chris Gutierrez, um, speaks to young people's everyday ingenuity. And so I want to lift that language 
Um, and I know Christina Stamatis was in this chat too, and she's she's played with some of this in some writing that we've done together as well. Um, and so, you know, I think about the ways that, what's it mean to talk about everyday texts uh, in contrast maybe, uh, or in tension to school-based texts and the kinds of tensions of what Danny was talking about, about the LAUSD books that we can't write into, right? And so walls is everyday texts, right? Whether or not you're allowed to write in them, they, they exist. And think about the, you know, we make the road by walking title um, of, you know, uh, the Palo Freire book as, as an example, right? Like what's it mean to engage in everyday texts with quote unquote <clears throat> everyday people, right? Our examples like this have focused on uh, graffiti, on Instagram, on Twitter, uh, except for the extent of the one AR book, uh, Accelerated Reader book, most of the examples that we engage with uh, really are about places that kids tend to engage with thinking and learning and action and, and activism outside of what school counts, uh, what, what counts as school, as well as I think what teachers might feel comfortable teaching about or teaching with, right? I think those feel like some real boundaries, right? In the same way that there is this wall erected around Lafayette Square, there is a wall erected around schools, sometimes literally, right? There's a big fence around the school I taught in, but also I think uh, cognitively and figuratively in terms of what counts as what gets into school and what doesn't. How porous is, is that boundary in terms of what's allowed to come into classrooms and not, and what's surveilled, uh, what is uh, illicit, right? I think those those might be some conversations that, that I'm thinking about with all of this right now. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, which I think just again is so helpful because here on Ontario, you know, speaking to what is again sanctioned by schools, yeah. we can see annotation again in some contexts and maybe not in LA certain classrooms as an everyday <laughs> literacy practice. But again, we've tried to shift the conversation here. Yeah. Um, I think for the sake of time, I'm going to quickly move through the mm -hmm. next set of, set of questions. But I think, again, I hope that these are questions that resonate, particularly for folks who are watching and listening and who are educators, which is that in the work that Ontario and I are doing, we're seeing annotation as an intertextual yep. practice, which raises for us perhaps a question of what discourses can learners join, remix, and resist through the kinds of intertextual practices. This particular sign, for those who, who, who want me to read it out, says, if we can flatten the curve, we can bend the arc. So you see there again, an intertextual play. Our students, of course, can make similar kind of intertextual moves themselves, again, perhaps through annotation. Um, we see annotation as multimodal, right? And so then a question arises, what modes of communication amplify agency, agency for perhaps a learner like Zaydan Cuevas, right? Yeah. As he helps to then shape, what does democracy look like? You know, we see annotation as dialogic. And so as discourses come into conversation with one another, you know, how might learners read and rewrite their world? And again, even again, back to Sharice and Joe's kind of tweets and conversations at this conference, it's incumbent upon us as educators to then be responsive to learners and their reading of their world, and then their writing and rewriting of their world, which yeah. I think for us leads us to another important example here, which is the role that annotation, again, can, not always, but can serve as counter narrative, and how can learners then kind of counter story injustices. Um, and there are some pretty compelling examples of that. And certainly the, the art of Alexandra Bell comes mm -hmm. to mind, but as do a number of other um, examples. And so again, questions that we've been wrestling with yeah. as we work through our book. Um, again, I'm just looking at my watch and I'm looking at the slides. And so I just want to really quickly move through a really rapid review of one other aspect of our work, which is this, this invitation, again, as contested and maybe as problematic as it may be, to write in our book. Yeah. Because again, annotation is literally, you know, these are our digits and we can write in books. And we invited folks to do that when this book was first drafted. Um, actually, I think that some of the folks who are with us today, including some folks at Hypothesis, joined in this open peer review that we ran for the book in the summer of 2019. We had quite a few folks participate. We got a lot of useful feedback as we then worked through our revisions and our thinking, as again, we've been sharing today. And this led to the creation in our book of these custom illustrations. Here are two examples where you're actually seeing digital pub pub comments, annotations that we then wove into these illustrations, which are full pages in the book. And it's now allowing readers to respond to us in this way. So here's the original illustration as we mocked it up. 
with these pub pub annotations. And here's a reader handwriting their response and then sharing it on Twitter, which is something that again, you might do and others are doing. And you know, the rest of this deck just shows a few examples of folks mm -hmm. who are taking that step um, and who are, you know, making their thinking visible. A quick shout out to the work that we'll be doing later this summer. So I'm gonna wrap it there in terms of sharing slides because I wanna really engage, I think, with people and the chat and what's going on here. And so yeah. um, thank you for folks who've been watching. I haven't been able to see anything because I've been sharing my screen. <laughs> um, but we're gonna just kind of like <clears throat> let the conversation move forward. Q&A, responses and thoughts as we continue to have this, this conversation with y'all. Yeah, I'd say yeah. Throw some throw some questions in the chat if if you'd like. Um, I think yeah. If you are if you uh, have not participated in the hashtag Anna Convo, I think there's a really robust um, conversation that's happening with the book and with each other in that space. Uh, and if you have participated and your book's all marked up, you should just buy another copy and start over again. I think that's that's the beautiful thing about Anna <laughs> books. You can just you can, you can do it. Do it. Deanza mentioned earlier and um, see see where you were wrong the first time you annotated it. And, Try again. That'd be that'd be my uh, encouragement. Dave Poston is like asking, "Where's the online copy?" And my answer to that is, "Who would want the online copy when you can get a handy print version that you can mark up with your own hands?" The online the online stuff is a that is a tricky contractual situation between MIT and e e publishing as a messy space is probably is probably my real answer. The the pub pub copy. Uh, is it's still up. Largely behind it's, still up. It's, it's up. You can you can access it now. Is that right? Um, it's still up. I, I looked at it again this even this morning. Um, pretty good. You know, I will say though that because of the response that we got from folks during this open review, um, and, and you know, I should say, given our commentary a few moments ago, that the decision working with a publisher like MIT Press to engage in an open review was part of our initiative to yep. not only practice what we preach, but to again further kind of play in this very complicated space around power and voice. And we knew that writing a book would go through a conventional peer review process. We knew that we would have some anonymous experts give us feedback and that we would be accountable to their perspectives. But we also knew that it would be useful to have many people, others, some invited and some who just showed up, tell us what they thought. And so that was another yep. way that we could work on notions of access and participation and power in our own production of the work. So that version is still online. But yeah. Because of that feedback, we revised that version quite considerably. Yeah. You know, prior to now, what is the what is the book? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's 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 fascinating how I think in the same way that an annotation might be stuck in time of, of a particular period when you annotate it, uh, our book is now fixed in time until until we make the second edition and become millionaires from it. Um, right? This is it is it is a statement from from a particular time and place. Um, yeah. So uh, I think there's a couple Q and A e things. I, yeah. So oh, wonderful. Yeah. Well, Christina, first of all, thank you for the question. Um, I, I think that. There is, let me let me say this, a lot of people who study scholarly annotation or even more specifically scholarly marginalia um, have a particular literal attachment, I will say, to this idea that annotations are permanent. And we can get into a whole kind of technical side question about the permanence of notes that are added to texts. Um, and this idea of being anchored, you know, in a very kind of tight relationship in a very material way. But your question about maybe augmented reality and projections, but also social media, I think does help us to think about the more fleeting and in some ways the importance of notes that are added to texts, but that that permanence is not necessarily a given. And I think that we could look at augmented reality we can look at projections like we saw on the monuments list last summer as very important, very intentional acts of annotation, of restoring, of resistance, of rewriting a narrative, both in a literal and symbolic way. But again, those projections are not anchored to that text forever, but yeah. in a particular moment. And then through perhaps media that captures that moment and then archives it, we do see those relationships in more proximal way. I think 
I, I agree with that. I think the thing I'd add to that point, though, is I think everything at the right scale is temporary, right? Even to an archivist, archivist dismay. Um, and any kind of annotation, be it an AR tool or an art installation, um, can be just as temporary as the first folios of, of Shakespeare or of um, a, a, a wall erected around this country or around the White House. Uh, and so I think that what I want to say is the temporary piece is we can think about the annotation, actually, Christine, to your work uh, around jazz is like a riff on a particular time and moment, right? And it is interplaying with the current context, um, but also with, with the kind of statement and authorial intent. I, I'll say I've been thinking a lot about tempor temporariness. I don't even know what the right word, like the right adjective is here. Um, uh, because I think, you know, that the real dismal part of me thinks uh, American democracy is not only in decline, but is deteriorating rapidly. And I would, I would equip, I would, I would, uh, I would compare this to something like cooling water, right? That every day, every insurrection, uh, every kind of atrocity on human dignity that that is happening makes this makes the water of the American fabric that much cooler in a way that we're just not paying attention to. But at some point we will flip from 33 that is 32 degrees Fahrenheit and it will become ice and we will suddenly see a world that is unrecognizable from the rest of us, right? At what point has annotation either prepared us for those practices with young people to the emancipatory practices that I think someone asked in the Q&A? And at what point have we not prepared young people for a new kind of landscape of where we're going, right? I think I think this is a real, this, this sounds maybe lofty, but I genuinely think this is where we're headed uh, and probably much more quickly than I think a lot of us are comfortable thinking about in schooling contexts. Yeah, Jeremy. Well, so let me just kind of riff here as well. I think that we need to grapple more with it. Um, an, an example from our drafting of the book that got cut. And it got cut because the historical record, at least that we were able to dig into, was hard to read, um, is the removal of an explicit statement against the enslavement of people um, to the King of England by those who drafted the Declaration of Independence. Um, it's clear that that initial draft of the Declaration included a more explicit denunciation of slavery. And it's also um, implied in a number of historical documents that there was an editing process in which those words were removed. Um, and so we can think of that again as some form of editing, redaction, revision that included some kind of annotation. Um, but the versions of the declaration that still exist don't show a clear enough use, at least in what we were able to access, yeah. to show that particular annotation. But scholars like Daniel Allen have, have written about this. And of course, her book um, is, is, is tremendous. And so, Jeremy, I'm with you. I think that there needs to be much more thought around this. But, but I guess my, my broader wrestling is that there is a social life of annotation. And we can look across the historical record as well documented as that record may be to see the ways in which annotation has been used um, or at least is an indicator or a mark of things that have become oppressive, things that have made then statements about more liberatory futures. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm also thinking about the fact that anyways, there's just there's just an, uh, too many examples of, 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 of annotation serving as marks of broader social injustice. Yeah. So. We should wrestle with this, Jeremy. I, I, I agree. I mean, a, a kind of example like this. I'm, I'm staying at my my in-laws right now. It's funny. This is like a the not most exciting background uh, here. Um, but I walk my dogs around uh, this neighborhood, and I walk past this elementary school that actually my wife went to many years ago. Um, and you know, there's a big fence around the elementary school. It's typical. There's all these signs, right? Some are social distancing signs. Some are about security cameras. Some are about school policies and where visitors need to check in when the school is operating. Um, and to some of the work that my colleague Jonathan Rosa speaks to as a, a racial linguist, uh, it, it's fascinating to me which kinds of signs are translated into Spanish and which aren't. And so which signs are there about inviting community, which signs are there about legality, and which signs are there about communicating necessary and safe information, right? And so to me, there, like, this is the opposite to some extent of it, it's still graffiti. It's still it's still words on walls to some extent, right? But this is this is power enacting particular kinds of visions of who gets to be a part of this community in what kinds of ways. And so I would just think about like, what are the what are the signs when you walk into the 
post, I guess, I don't, I don't know if people are safely walking in the post office right now, but you know, when you're walking into a building, what signs show up and what are they saying? What language are they saying? And who is it? What kinds of assumptions is it making about the, the literacy practices of a, of a social, um, social community? Yeah. Yeah. I really, I really appreciate. Yeah. I appreciate both parts of this question. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious what freeform writing is and why schools wouldn't support it maybe as a starting place. Um, yeah. As someone who has at some point in my life taught the five paragraph essay, uh, I, I think I know what not free form writing is, but why don't we make all writing free, right? Let's, let's use the word free um, as a starting place there. Um, gateway is interesting. I'm not sure if I think of it as a gateway or if it is the creativity in and of itself. Like that's what I wonder, um, is, is the gateway a gateway? You know, there, there's also the Arundhati Roy quote that was really popular during the pandemic of, you know, pandemic is portal and we're going to step through to this other public, to this other imaginative world. That didn't happen, right? Like a year and a half later, we are still on one side of that portal. And I think people are just as oppressed as they were before, if not more so. Um, and, you know, I think about, you know, what, what, would a, what would a gateway through annotation actually mean um, for us to construct? And, you know, to, in my opinion, it doesn't make sense for, to cis men to make a decision of what that gateway looks like <laughs> in 2021. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, yeah, perhaps also in the same way that, and the question perhaps, uh, thank you again for the question, reminds me that there's still so much gatekeeping about whose texts and whose narratives are included in schools. Um, and so maybe annotation, you know, as separate from other forms of, again, creative writing, analytic writing, expository, whatever kind of you know, formal aspects of literacy instruction um, are kind of codified in school, that annotation is a way to expand the register of whose ideas one is engaging with. Um, and I think that, you know, we can, as literacy educators and teacher educators, look to you know, various social media discourses, whether it's, you know, build your stack and people sharing, you know, images of books that they're reading to disrupt texts, you know, to the book chat, to these other kind of literacy education spaces where educators are trying to, I think, expand the register, so to speak, of what counts as quote unquote the canon. And as a complement, perhaps, to those kinds of efforts and initiatives, annotation is one way of encouraging students to come into conversation with those perspectives, those authors, those ways of being, as a way of recognizing that you know, there are many knowledges here and many voices that count in this kind of academic discourse. Yeah, I love that. I see Chris mentioned the marginal syllabus in here. Remy, have you already talked about that elsewhere? Do you want to do you want to give a shout out? You know, I'll give a quick shout out. Sharice actually did a really lovely job of mentioning it in the digital literacy session. And I'll just say that I know we see this as another way of just encouraging the kind of interest driven, more equity oriented approach to professional learning that some teachers really thrive to engage with. I see that Joe Dillon is here. He's, of course, a co-founder and facilitator of that, you know, dear friend and colleague. Um, but again, it's just leveraging the social affordances of annotation as a way to engage with critical conversation. Some people will pick that up. Some people will run with that. Some people will see that as a model. But it's like, think again, one project of many that is, you know, we don't have grand ambitions that it's going to become, you know, more than it already is, yeah. but it's a, it's a model. And it's perhaps at this point, five years in, it's proven a certain point about how social annotation can play a central role in more equity oriented professional learning. Yeah, I think the data piece is interesting, right? I think that's the, you know, if a student's annotating, whether or not they, the idea of choice around this is fascinating, right? Who gets to annotate and like, are you expected to annotate? Um, could be really useful as a, as a collection of data. But I would, what I would push on is data for whom and for what purpose, right? If it's about schools being able to speak to assessment metrics, I could care less about that. And I think that's actually particularly damaging personally. And I also get why schools want that, right? If it's students being able to see for themselves, here's here's where my colleagues and my peers are thinking, and here's how we might be able to work towards, towards something that's uh, intersectional and collective and, and powerful, then I think we can get to something pretty powerful um, I might reimagine a quote unquote canon if that's a conversation that, that still needs to happen right now in terms of what are the most important texts for young people uh, in this part of the country, in this in this uh, current context would be a starting point for me personally. Absolutely. Absolutely. My friend. Hey, we did it. Thank you. Look at this. 
uh, we, we, you know, I know that we've run up on our hour and, you know, again, just on behalf of, you know, folks who are here and who will also watch and listen later, thank you so much for engaging with us. As you can see, Ontario and I are, are engaging in rough draft thinking, you know, we're working through our thoughts about this. And I think that there's a long, you know, history of that. And there will continue to be a practice of that. And our book is, again, just a point in time along that rough draft thinking journey around these issues. So yeah. thank you so much for thinking with us today. Um, reach out, be in touch, connect. And, and again, thanks to Hypothesis and everybody organizing for giving us the space to, to come forward. Yeah, thanks, everyone.